Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, this is sort of a no-notice live stream. I wanted to take advantage of our good friend Sal's expertise. And anybody who watches broadcast news these days knows he's in very high demand. We are getting him between MSNBC and CNN. Um, and he just did a hit with MSNBC. So, Sal, thank you for joining us today. Oh, happy to be here, Ward. Just remind everybody that Sal is the host of the What Is Going On With Shipping channel. It's rapidly growing and is the place to go with all kinds of stuff, but particularly when it deals with situations like this. And so I'm thinking back to all the times that we've connected. We've always had this foot stomper about people don't appreciate how their stuff gets to them, you know, whether it was ever given or Houthis. And now this particularly is a, a choke point that will affect commerce. But let's first talk about the event itself and then the the after effects and, and what, what happens after this happens. So yesterday I woke up at my usual zero dark 30 and saw this on a loop over and over again. Yep. Um, and it was one of those, where were you when this happened kind of things. But at the time I didn't really realize it. You know, and and uh, I'm just watching, and then I see Francis Scott Key Bridge, Baltimore. I'm like, oh, holy smokes! This, you know, th this is something that affects us very locally. I'm here in Annapolis. I've traveled across the Francis Scott Key Bridge many times. It's the way we go north to Philly and Jersey if I-95 is shut down. And so you're like, this this is a pretty big deal. And then as it unfolded, the level of the tragedy got greater and greater. So let's let's set the scene here. First, let's talk about the area. So here's a Google Maps view of where the Francis Scott Key Bridge. It is the outermost bridge across the Papsico River that leads to Baltimore and the Baltimore Harbor. And I'll let you speak to the various facilities, Dundalk and, and whatnot, as we go along here. But this is the God's eye view of where the bridge is. The ship in question is the motor vessel Dolly. Um, this is Dolly in better times. Note all the Maersk containers. Sal, talk to us about this ship. So Dolly is, you keep hearing him talk about it's a big ship, and it really, it's not. It, it's actually a medium-sized container ship for what's out there. About 1,000 feet long, a little bit shorter than that, uh, can carry about 10,000 TEU. Uh, right now, she's carrying roughly around 4,700 containers. Uh, the ship is operated, you know, it's owned by a, a company called Grace Pacific out in Singapore. It's operated by a company called Synergy, and it's leased over to Maersk. And Maersk has it operating on a route along the east coast of the U.S. down to Sri Lanka. And the ship was outbound from Baltimore heading to Sri Lanka via the Panama Canal because it can't get that way going through the Suez Canal. So it's going through the Panama Canal because of the Houthi. And this is when the ship encountered the problem. This ship is, you know, if you want the, the parallel for what this ship kind of does, it's very similar to the uh, uh, the Amazon delivery guy that shows up in your house in the holidays in a rental car, you know, because uh, there's not enough Amazon vans. That's basically what this ship is. It's filling a capacity right now for Maersk because they need container ships because of the dispersion that's going on due to the Houthi. That's a great analogy. So like most things, you look at that loop and I posted that on X and immediately the conspiracy theory started rolling in. This is what's great about what you do is dismiss that sort of bad gouge as we say. So let me bring up the longer form. Uh, I'm not sure what agency owns this camera, but let's do kind of a coach's clicker and I'll accelerate it to certain points and, and you give us the, uh, the information on, on what's going on. So here we are, lights on, lights off. So what happened there? Yeah, so we have a, a loss of power and, and you know this as well as I do, Ward. The worst feeling or the worst sound I've ever heard on the ship is silence because that is, you know, there's always a sound going. And so now you are at basically the mercy of momentum and the winds and currents at this point. 
And this this had to be the most heart dropping moment for this crew. You got engineers down in, in the engine space scrambling in the dark with emergency lighting and flashlights trying to figure out what has caused it. Now, we, we don't know. There's a report out by CNN from uh, dock workers saying that when this ship was tied up to the uh, Seagirt terminal, which is right behind that there in that picture, they had experienced power drops. So we don't know what caused the power drop. It'll be interesting to find out if there was a systematic issue at play here that was not conveyed to the pilots, the ship pilots, not not aviators, but pilots who pilot ships. Uh, it's not clear that was conveyed. If that was conveyed to the pilots, they probably would have either you know waited for the ship to be repaired or gone out in more favorable conditions or had the tugs with them. But what we have right now is this point where the power goes out, the uh, immediately the ship's pilot sends out word that they have lost power, sends out the mayday. This is going to kick in motion on the bridge there efforts because DOT is going to be relayed this information from the, the pilots association from the Coast Guard. They're going to stop traffic. I mean, you watch this video very carefully. You see traffic going across this bridge until that last moment. Yeah, but that right you now, know, reminds me of, Sal, is that Norman Schwarzkopf, when he was, you know, narrating that that FLIR footage of the vehicle going yeah. across the bridge, booby on bridge, and, the, you know, the luckiest Iraqi. <laughs> That's kind of how I feel about these truckers right here that we're seeing right now, you know, going across the span here. Yeah. Um, I don't know if they were cognizant. You know, I know when I go across either the Bay Bridge or this bridge, I'm not generally looking down at the ships. And sometimes when you are, you think it's kind of very cool when it when it happens. I'm going to look at that very differently now, uh, particularly when we're going across the Bay Bridge, which uh, has a lot of traffic, um, you know, on, on any given day. Uh, so they pushed away from, you said, is it this pier we can see, the, these cranes we can see under the major spanner? Is it right behind where Dolly is right now? If you're looking at the center of the bridge right there where the red flashing light is, it's just to the right. So it's just uh, to that area to the right there. You can see the cranes actually lifted up with a series of four little white lights there. Okay. That was, that's the berth she actually came off of. So a lot of people are like, why don't they have tugs? Uh, so did they use tugs to push away from the pier? And then once they're underway, the tugs are, are out of there? Or how does that work? Yeah, they had two McAllister tugs. So if you're in ba if you're in Baltimore, you know what I'm talking about. Red tugs with a big M on them. You'll see them everywhere uh, rolling around. So the McAllister tugs right there would have taken them off the berth. Uh, and you don't typically have the tugs escort you out because just before Dolly left, MSC Toronto left. So those two same tugs took the Toronto off and then they went to go work Dolly. So, yeah, you would not have the tugs. There's no reason to do it. 99.99%, you know, at the time, there's not an issue with ships going under bridges. They go under infrastructure all the time. This bridge was designed 50 years ago to allow ships to go underneath it without an issue. The problem is Dolly is bigger than any ship really that came into Baltimore back 50 years ago. And ships are just getting bigger. Well, but it does fit under that main span. Oh, yeah. It right. comes right underneath the main span. Yeah. So... Um, okay, so what is the SOA at this point, the, the forward speed of, of the container ship? Roughly? She's, do, she's doing about eight knots, and so about 10 miles, a little under 10 miles an hour at this time, which doesn't sound like much. But again, full speed for these vessels. These aren't naval vessels. They'll run about 16 to 20 knots, depending on where they're going, probably on the lower end there right now to save money and, and to be more efficient. Yeah, and so the physics of it, you know, 10, you know, 10 miles an hour with that displacement, that's a lot of heft moving forward, and it's impossible to stop. The other thing that the Monday morning quarterbacks were doing right out of the gate is why don't they drop the anchor? And I know from your reporting that, in fact, they did. So talk to us about that. They do. And so it's, it's not unusual to have an anchor, you know, a, a team up on the bow to be able to drop the anchor. Again, it takes one person to drop an anchor. You know, once you get it set and it's ready to drop, you can go ahead and just release the brake. Now, you, there's usually safety mechanisms you're going to have to release. It's, it, there's a process to do it. The problem with an anchor is an anchor is designed to hold you in place. It is not designed to stop you. It's not it. It doesn't do what the Missouri did in the movie Battleship, where you drop it in the middle of the Pacific and then you wind up doing a handbrake turn. That's that's not what it does. But in this case, you know, they couldn't wait for the speed to come down. They had to do something. And we're not clear exactly when they splash the port anchor think they do it when the generator comes online and you see lights come back onto the vessel. So that's right here. Boom, yep. lights back on. 
So to your point about the anchor, roughly what's the depth of the water here? So you're running at about 50 feet, uh, a little under 50 feet in the main channel. Okay, so but they're not in the channel. Are they still in the channel at this no, they're point? No, still, they're, they're still smacking the channel. They're, it's not until the, when you see that vessel kind of twist and turn okay. that they start coming out of the channel. Well, we'll talk about that in a second. So it takes, again, in terms of the subject matter experts who were immediately on X, um, even if you're right there, drop the anchor. It takes a while to come out of the hose pipe and, and hit the water and then descend to 50 feet to the bottom. And then those flukes don't immediately, like you said, it's not a, a break. And so that could drag, you know, so even if they were, and it sounds like they were pretty quick to drop it, that's not going to solve the problem, just to be very clear. No, and this is going to be a mud bottom because it's been dredged and it's dredged continually. So, you know, and they're not dropping it immediately. It's going to take time, you know, you know, and plus we, we don't know the process. This is why we want the vessel data recorder because it records uh, the conversation on the bridge. So we'll know when the, the anchor is dropped. It has to be dropped at the bow. There's no switch or anything that does it. You have to physically do it right. up on the bow. And so, you know, normally, you know, 50 feet of water, you would drop 250 feet of chain out, maybe maybe 300 to hold you in the position. This isn't holding. You're trying to slow the ship down. And understand the anchor is not going to stop you. It's just trying to slow down the vessel at this point. Plus, we don't know if they would actually drop it at this point, because, again, if the emergency generator came on, they may have rudder control. It doesn't appear that they do because the ship begins to drift to the south to, toward the southern end of that 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 bridge. And, you know, if you don't have rudder control, because you'd still steer the ship without the propeller as long as the ship has forward motion on with the rudder. But we're not clear that it has it. OK, so lights are back on. So, again, just to review, when you, when we see the lights out here, they don't have rudder control. There's no aft steering. There's no backup mechanism in the event you lose power. No, not like a Navy ship where we're standard. You would have an aft steering team down there and you could physically take control. There's no one in after steering on these vessels. You would have, you know, crew in the engine room up on the bridge. You would have, uh, you know, basically your guys getting lines in still probably stowing them below decks. Uh, and you would have, a, you know, a few personnel on the bow there standing by the anchor. OK, so like we're saying, lights come back on. We don't we're not sure if they have steerage again or what what they're what's happening. Um Traffic still, traffic is not going southbound. Um, it looks like the last vehicle has gone, is going northbound. So heads up ball by uh, whomever to shut down the toll booths there and stop traffic. Now you still have, whoops, hold on, here comes another truck. This is the last guy, I think. But these flashing lights in the span there are a work crew. Here comes a couple more trucks. This is a work crew that's doing nighttime work on the bridge um so that they you know become uh, uh casualties here as the event unfolds so i think this truck is the last truck that that makes it across so again heads up ball mayday call boom stop traffic we're fortunate look at the timestamp 126 30 so this didn't happen during rush hour happened late at night so that's good okay so now the other thing to point out here, let me go back a smidge. Um, so at right about here, you start seeing black smoke belch out of um, one of the stacks or the port stack. So what's that indicative of? So that's probably them trying to restart the main engine. You know, the way you start a marine diesel engine is with a slug of air. you got to use compressed air to get the pistons going to create the compression in the cylinders. And understand, this is a diesel engine that is massive in size. I mean, I don't think people appreciate it. It's a single, you know, slow speed diesel engine that's directly connected to the propeller. So, I mean, you have direct connection to the propeller. Uh, and these cylinders are, you know, you could stand inside these cylinders. These things are huge. And what this probably is, the black smoke is indicative of, of is that air slug coming in, blowing everything out and an effort to kind of kick power back on. And, you know, one of the things you'll see is, is, is it looks like they get main power back on. We see the front running light come back on, the four, the four mass light comes on, but then they lose power again. And, you know, and then you see power drop out again. 
And, you know, this could be the systematic problem that they had. Again, you know, it could be, uh, you know, the, the water is not coming into the ship. So that's turning everything off with a sensor. You have to know what is causing the, the, the failure to basically bypass it. There's not a big red button you push override that, that turns everything off. You've got to know what's going on. And what we're seeing is notice that smoke, how it's blowing almost flat you know, to the left of the screen, that means there's high wind. That means there's a good breeze coming in here. And that ship is like the side of a barn. I mean, it's just going to catch all the wind and that's going to start moving it in. Now, when they get power back on briefly, they may try to reverse the engine. Uh, I, I haven't been able to find out if this is a left or right-handed propeller yet, because that would talk about which way the ship would want to swing its bow. Uh, but it, what you're seeing here, and it, it's more pronounced in this video because of the the, the 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 perspective you have. But if you look at AIS, the ship moves just a little bit. It's not a lot. It, it, this seems like it turns hard right. It isn't. It's just angling that way. And unfortunately, it's angling out of the channel at this point. And this is the moment where probably the anchor would definitely would have been dropped by this point. Uh, they would have been doing everything, realizing that they're heading toward the southern stanchion of the bridge. Yeah. So we're about 90 seconds before impact. You make a great point there. And I'm thinking back to my YP days, you know, um, and, you know, I was an aviator, but I did have some, you know, training at the Naval Academy for seamanship and navigation. And you have to con a YP alongside another YP and also alongside the pier. And you learn that in a fluid medium, it's not like a car where you go in reverse and you back straight down. You have to understand, as you said, is it a right hand prop or a left hand screw? And that affects how it's going to re react when you go all full aft. And so if you're trying to stop by slamming the engines into reverse, you could exacerbate the problem in terms of station keeping in the channel. And, and it, that we're not trying to get ahead of the facts, but that could have been uh, a, a factor here that caused them to veer that way along with you bring up a great point about the sail area of that that vessel with all those containers there um you know again set and drift you have to understand currents you have to understand all kinds of stuff uh when you're when you're maneuvering a, a vessel of, the, of any size but this size particularly and, and that's what makes this really horrific because if this happened a minute earlier a minute later then the ship you know swings in you know you know, it grounds before it gets to the bridge, you know, because it goes out of the channel or it passes the bridge and swings out of the channel. It's just the timing here is is just the worst. And, and, and that that's the issue that I think drives a lot of people crazy because, you know, again, they're, they take for granted that this happens on a daily basis, you know, almost hourly in some cases where big ships are crossing under infrastructure. And, and, and you know, we, we you know, I, I use the analogy all the time. You and I pass each other on a road 55 miles an hour. The only thing that keeps us from running into each other is a 16th of an inch of yellow paint. We take for granted that that stuff is magical. It's going to keep us from doing it. But if all of a sudden my tire blows, if my engine stalls, if something happens, I may not be able to hold myself in the road. And, you know, accidents happen very quickly. And this is is kind of the worst because this is a four minute slow drag out of an incident that you see happening. It, it had to be horrific for the crew on board to see this happen. Yeah. Yeah. So we're about uh, 90 seconds from impact here. I think these the vessel, the, the vehicles we see now exiting to the left are the, the final ones. Um, Again, those folks, I hope they went home and hugged their families. It's uh, just incredible that only six people died on this. If this was yeah, rush hour, yeah. I can't, I, you know, I, I, this keeps running through my head is there's a bus on it. There's a kids, you know, this is, this is morning or, or evening, man, this is just, this is hundreds of people that could have yeah. died on this. So collision imminent now, a minute out again, these flashing lights here is that work crew um, who accounted for the, the casualties. The names are, are, are coming out one by one on the local affiliates here. Um, so at this point, like you said, Sal, they're just braced for impact. And there it goes. You see the splash. Yeah, that's the, that's the hull there hitting up against the concrete stanchions at this point. If you see the, the pictures of the vessel, especially the starboard side, you'll see the gash in the forward bow where it hit. But the ship keeps moving. You know, there is no dolphin or barrier between this. Again, you know, that's something that should have probably been discussed 
when the port of Baltimore went through its expansion. It dredged the port. It put in new cranes. These are things that probably should have been looked at, but they weren't. So there weren't outer barriers, dolphins or barriers to stop it. So this ship physically hits the stanchion and then the boxes itself will hit the bridge. And what you do is basically just knock the legs out from this bridge. Yeah, I mean, it, it just topples. Look at that immediately, immediately. And you can see the, the guide wires here on this part of the suspension bridge. Uh, horrific, horrific, like the Hindenburg, the, I, the, the slow death of it is just horrific. I watched it the other morning when you, like you said, I watched it and I just kept coming back to September 11th and, and the collapse of the building. It was just watching it unfold in this slow motion, knowing what was going to happen was just, I mean, it's just, it's a nightmare for deck officers to be up there and, you know, and to know a collision is going to happen and there's nothing you can do about it. It's just, you know, hang on because, you know, it, it, and, and most importantly, it, it, it's going to impact other people. So immediate effects, Port of Baltimore is closed. I-695 has no Eastern part of the loop anymore around Baltimore. That is the beltway around Baltimore. Um, so what are the, what are the impacts immediately to global commerce? Well, I, I mean, you get a couple of things, I, you know, this is part of I-95 too. So let's remember that. So, you know, you're going to have to go down the West side of Baltimore now the whole way. Uh, Port of Baltimore does about $74 billion worth of trade last year, about 47 million tons of cargo. About 90% of the port facilities are on the other side of the Patasco Bridge now trapped inside of, of inside of Baltimore. Uh, so you're looking at $100 million potentially of revenue a day that's being lost. Workers who are supposed to show up at the docks don't have jobs right now to do it. This is going to cause displacement. You're going to have to deliver cargo to other places. So for containers, for cars, for uh, 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 other commodities like that, you can go to other ports. The problem is companies now are declaring force majeure. And so what that means is, you know, if your container was destined for Baltimore, well, I'm going to drop it off wherever I want. I may drop it off in Miami. I may drop it off in, in Oakland. And you're going to have to deal with getting it there. So this is going to cause a lot of disruptions. Baltimore is the largest importer of cars into the U.S. So that's going to happen. We're going to see, you know, cars have to shift. It's the second largest exporter of coal. It has a significant LNG facility at Cove Point. Uh, it is the largest importer of sugar and salt into the United States. And we're looking at weeks, if not months, to be able to clear this wreck out of the way to be able to open the channel. Obviously, we're, we're hearing the federal government is in intervening. We're going to get federal assets and, and assistance, but we just don't have the salvage capacity and the infrastructure to really deal with this. So, you know, Don John Smith, the company is going to be doing it. are going to have to be bringing in resources from not just around the country, but potentially around the world to start, you know, dismantling this bridge. And then in the meantime, someone's got to be coming up with new plans for a bridge and we're talking probably five years at the at the outset for that. If you look at the Tampa Bridge back in 1980, I think it was five to seven years to get that bridge rebuilt and back in place. So I know that the Army Corps of Engineers has uh, mobilized a thousand personnel to try to clear uh, an interim channel here. Um, how long do you think that kind of thing is going to take? Well, I mean, you got to get everything in place. Uh, you got to have the right equipment for it. I mean, Army Corps of Engineers has some salvage equipment, but they're mainly dredgers. Uh, again, you're, you're just going to need to get a lot of, you know, people who can weld and cut steel and start, you know, taking apart. This is going to be really risky, too. Let's be careful. It's a really dangerous operation. You're dealing in a current in, in, in absolutely black water. So you've got to take apart not just the lattice structure above. You've got to remove the roadway. Uh, at the same time, you're in a recovery operation, so you're looking for bodies, you're looking for cars, you're looking for whatever may have come off this bridge. So it, it, it will take some time. I mean, again, I, my best prospect here is is weeks into months. I mean, it may be one, two months before we see the Port of Baltimore open. Uh, I don't know. It depends on how much money we throw at this and the amount of resources we have. So I, I think we're definitely going to have uh, not quite unlimited of, of each, but as you suggest, this is a major hub. Uh, the impacts are not just around Maryland or Baltimore. Uh, they are global. 
I will so, add one other thing real quick too. Uh, there are four strategic sea lift ships that are stuck in this port now. So out of a fleet of 50 so vessels, you know, now almost, you know, 10% of the fleet is stuck in Baltimore, two of the fast sea lift ships and LMSR and one of the uh, RRF Ruros there. So, you know, this does have an implication. This is what happens. This is why, you know, it's really important to have reliance not on just one port, but multiple ports. You know, we can shift some things over, but, you know, if we were working on a strategy where we just had a couple of big ports and something like this happened, this could be catastrophic. And let's be clear, this could happen tomorrow in Bayonne going to the port of New York, New Jersey. Uh, we can see an instance, you know, of, of Long Beach or Los Angeles happening too. Uh, there are a lot of infrastructure dangers that we have around the, the country. So here's an image of the after effects. So what are the concerns about fuel leakage and stabilization of this ship? I mean, it's not it's not out of the woods uh, yet. No, it's not. And so, you know, the, the ship is a ground that came out in the in the latest uh, press conference. Uh, the uh, vice admiral and I forget his last name. I apologize for the Coast Guard in charge of operations gave a talk. He says that the ship is grounded forward where it hit the uh, the base where the bridge is. They are assessing the vessel right now. Uh, they're working on a plan to get her off. They have a containment boom around the vessel to catch anything. They would be assessing the shock damage. I mean, the vessel went from eight knots to zero. So, I mean, there could be potential shock damage on the vessel. But, you know, the biggest issue for moving this vessel is going to be getting that bridge off the structure itself. This may involve dismantling part of the structure uh, before they can remove it. They've had a container collapse, but they only lost two containers. And usually up forward uh, is usually either empty containers or unfortunately, usually sometimes hazardous material. But we had a, an assurance that there was no hazardous material lost or damaged. Well, that, that's certainly some good news. Um, so um, what are the immediate lessons learned here for the maritime industry, Sal? Well, I think the big one's going to be is looking at this vessel and did it have a systematic problem with it? You know, one of the, the groups I highlight all the time is the role played by the U.S. Coast Guard. U.S. Coast Guard has 11 missions, and I would argue that their 11th mission is doing what's called port state control, going on board foreign ships coming into U.S. ports and ensuring they're safe to operate. Uh, I will tell you that 11th mission is probably the 11th ranking mission in terms of priority and, 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 and personnel. Uh, I think we need to really seriously relook at that because we have a lot of ships coming in and out of our ports all the time. We need to ensure those ships are properly maintained uh, and, and crewed and operated because if not, we can see a situation like this happen. What happens if you have a ship that gets hit and sinks in the channel coming out of Norfolk or coming into San Diego? You know, you can basically shut off part of the U.S. Navy in one fell swoop. Uh, this is something we need to be a little bit more serious about our infrastructure. And it all has to do with the fact that we move cargo at a volume and velocity today never before seen, which means when you're moving at that much rate and speed, when an accident happens, it tends to be disproportionately big. And that's what we're seeing right now. So what's our understanding of the casualty count? And are they still involved in a search and rescue operation? Were there any cars in the water? Yeah, there's believed to be some cars they mentioned, but we're not sure if those cars were on the bridge with part of that work group. Uh, there are six confirmed uh, fatalities or missings at this point that they're in the process of doing a search. And I have to say, being a diver myself and being involved in, in, in a volunteer fire department for 25 years, uh, doing a dive on this area has got to be some of the most hazardous I can potentially think of with regards to the current, the debris underneath there, the wreckage. Uh, this is some high level diving. There have been I, I saw an estimate of about 200 rescue personnel brought in from all over the region to do the diving on this. And, you know, the first responders who, who, who are at the scene are doing amazing work. I mean, the Coast Guard was immediately on scene along with Harbor Patrol and Harbor Police from Baltimore. Uh, there's a lot of unsung heroes here that we really need to acknowledge, but uh, obviously it's a recovery operation. So they're gonna start working on that salvage, I think pretty soon. Yeah, sympathies with the families who lost loved ones in this, this tragedy. Um, 
the weather here is is getting it's taking a turn for the worse. So the whatever they're doing in terms of salvage and and the ongoing investigations are going to get tougher in the next couple of days. The wind's picking up. Sea temperature is already low at 47. That is not warm. That's hypothermia inducing. Yep. Uh, so as you mentioned, Sal, the divers are certainly uh, uh, you know leveraging all of their skills to to make this happen here. So Sal, you're a busy guy. Thank you for putting some time out for us here in between a couple of media hits on, on the big, the big boy stations. America literally needs you right now. So I'm, I'm proud of the fact that the producers of the world have realized your expertise. Uh, so again, Sal is the host of what's going on with shipping YouTube channel, subscribe, and you will get the information firsthand from him whenever it needs to be delivered. Well, Ward, I, Ward, I want to appreciate you having me on. Uh, I, I know a lot of your subscribers came over to my channel. They say it all the time. They, I, I'm here because of Ward. So thank you, sir. I appreciate it a great deal. Okay, thanks. We'll talk again very soon. All right, that'll do it for this episode. Thank you. We had a really big crowd here joining us for this no-notice live stream. As soon as I shut this off, it becomes a regular episode. Apologize we didn't get to look at any of the comments. Hopefully you guys were talking to each other. But appreciate the attendance. And if you're not already a subscriber, become one so you don't miss anything like these no notice live streams going forward. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again very soon.